Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed your lunch. We're starting our afternoon sessions right now. Um, for our next session, we have Tom Morgan. He's a um, American Institute Certified Planner with TZM Planning. He's going to be talking about preparing planning boards for solar farms and for EV fast charging stations. So welcome, Tom. Thank you for your time and your volunteering for us today with your expertise. So we, uh, you're ready to take it away. Thank you, Stephanie. You're welcome. Uh, yes, as Stephanie mentioned, I'll be uh, talking about how to integrate a 100-year-old zoning uh, structure into modern technology. But much of the zoning in New Hampshire does date back 100 years. And uh, the technology we're going to be addressing will be uh, solar farms and electrical vehicle fast charging stations because they are on the horizon. They're, they're going to be coming at us in the near term, uh, whether you're ready for them or not. This is... Um, uh, I'm a, as Stephanie mentioned, I'm a planning consultant. I've been based in Portsmouth for 41 years. I advise municipalities uh, throughout Southern Maine and Southeast New Hampshire. And I also uh, have, have, have another job as a, as a town official in the town of Seabrook. It's, it's part-time, very much part-time. It's about four hours a week. But um, that, that's, that's more of a conventional town planner position, albeit it's, it's uh, limited hours. But that's where a lot of my experience is from, is in Seabrook and in Portsmouth. We'll be talking about that a lot today. And uh, what we're looking at is a solar farm down in uh, North Texas. Give you an idea of what's going on in the rest of the country. Give you a little context of how New Hampshire fits in the larger picture. This uh, this solar farm is um, it covers nearly 1,700 acres. It's in Childress, Texas, up north by Oklahoma, about 230 miles northwest of Dallas. And uh, I've been uh, I've been going on road trips, zigzagging around the country. And oftentimes, when I see a wind farm or a solar farm, I can't help myself. I pull over and I put the uh, the drone up in the air to have a look around. And that's what's going on here. We're looking at it from 400 feet. That's me over down on the. That's the pilot on the lower left there. And. Um, it's called the Mesa Solar Park. It's um, powers 60,000 homes. As I mentioned, it's almost 1,700 acres. And um, it's the, the rated uh, generating capacity is 240 megawatts AC. That's much larger than we're likely to ever see in New Hampshire. Um, but look at the difference here in the, in the chart up on the left. 230, 240 is the, the AC, alternating current. That's typically the way power generating plants are, are measured in the United States, and 324 is the megawatts that produce dir um, direct current, DC. And the reason they have both is because the solar technology produces um, direct current, and it has to be converted to alternating current in order to um, get onto the grid and, and go into our homes and businesses. And here are some terms that you'll uh, be running into. Shows you, um, gives you an idea of um, the, the magnitude of one, one kilowatts, a thousand watts, megawatts, a thousand, uh, one million watts. And what's not on this chart is is a, a gigawatt. That would be 1,000 megawatts. So give you a sense of how much electricity that is. The Seabrook nuclear power plant uh, is rated at 1.2 gigawatts. And let's see. Problem advancing here. And speak of Seabrook, uh, here's a direct comparison between our 1700 acre solar farm and more conventional generating station. This one's in Seabrook. Of course, it's the largest nuclear reactor in New England. And uh, you can see that Seabrook station generates uh, about five times more electricity than this massive solar farm we're looking at. Seabrook sits on about 100 acres of land as compared to the solar farm, which is nearly 1,700. Now, we'll hear a lot of talk about uh, uh, this type of generating capacity can power so many homes. It's actually more complicated, and there's a lot of bad information out there. Uh, but in terms of um, solar farms, um, we, we'll take an example of one megawatt. That's a small solar farm. That's about five acres. And you see on this chart, it may be too small for you to see, but we, each line, each bar in this graph is, is one of the 50 states in the United States. And the point being is, the um, for reasons we'll get into in a moment, the 
the, the, the uh, one megawatt can power um, 90 houses in Louisiana and about 270 in California. Why is that? Well, uh, th what they recognize in this, people put together this, this chart is that uh, the, the number varies from one part of the United States to another, and that's because the climate varies. And, and in Louisiana, for example, it's very hot and humid in the summer for a long time in the summer. So they, they're, um, gen they're consuming a lot of electricity just to keep their homes cool. Whereas California, Hawaii, New Mexico, up at the top of the bar, they, uh, their, their demand for electricity is much less. So one megawatt will go a lot further. So you have a range in the United States from, say, 90 in Louisiana up to 270 in California. Uh, New Hampshire is 160, and that's the number you need to remember because we are in New Hampshire. Um, I've heard a lot of numbers thrown around that are really off, but this 160 is something you can bank on. Now, if you do have a solar um, proposal coming to your city or town, the neighbors, of course, will turn out and they'll be concerned. They'll be They'll be uh, asking questions because the technology is, is new and um, mostly unknown. Um, they'll be wondering if it's going to make any noise. And the answer is yes, but it's gonna, the noise is going to be so low that uh, nobody's going to hear it. The, um, the, the yellow arrow is pointing to an inverter. Uh, the inverters are a um, piece of technology that's necessary to, to convert the direct current into alternating current. And you can see in this solar farm in Texas, there are there are about a dozen of them out there, but the uh, inverters um, generate about the same amount of noise as your refrigerator, which is to say about 40 decibels. So uh, the answer is yes, they do make a little bit of noise, but um, people outside the solar farm are never going to hear it. And here's a, a map by the um, solar industry that's mapping all the existing and, and proposed and under construction solar um, facilities in the United States. The size of the circle uh, represents the size of the, uh, the solar farm. So you can see the development is uneven. It's there's just a lot of action going on in Texas and Nevada, California, and up and down the East Coast. Look up in the Northeast and, and you get a couple little white spots up there. One is Northern Maine and the other is the state of New Hampshire. New Hampshire is, is, uh, uh, is behind much of the United States in terms of solar development, but that will change and it's going to change soon, I expect. Now, I don't expect you to be able to read this. I was just stunned when I saw this. I was looking on the internet for something else entirely and came across this. Uh, we all do that. We look for one thing, we stumble on something else. What it was is the minutes of a planning board meeting from Elliott, Maine, and it and I was looking at the, the single spaces and no paragraph breaks, and it went on for 36 pages. And I said, what is going on here? And I, I started to read it. And uh, it was it's just that Elliot was just really struggling with a solar proposal. That's what this 36 pages of single space material is all about. And the, uh, the neighbors were uh, um, very much against it, and they were throwing everything but the kitchen sink at this one. And uh, at the end of the meeting, the planning board said, well, you know, it's true, we, we did vote to accept this plan as complete last month, but now we're not sure what to do because our zoning ordinance doesn't address the solar farms. It doesn't address this technology at all. We have no criteria in which to make a decision. And they, uh, they were unsure what to do. And then somebody made a motion to deny and to deny carry the carried, carried the day. And they ended up um, denying the solar developer. He went to court. And the judge said, now, come on, give me a break. You know, you guys accepted the plan and then you say you don't know what to do. So um, that did not work out well for Elliot. Um, but as I'm reading this, I'm thinking there must be a lot of other towns in New Hampshire that are probably as ill-equipped as Elliot is to respond to a proposal for a solar farm. So that's, that's what put the idea in my head to make a presentation today that we're, we're making right now. Now, uh, in order to understand how traditional zoning is a bad fit for some of the modern technology, we've got to go look back at where did zoning come from and what were they trying to achieve 100 years ago. And I'm going to bring you back to Portsmouth. This is uh, Market Square in 1907. And um, you can uh, see two police officers walking across the square. Those of you who 
been to Portsmouth, familiar with Portsmouth, you recognize the building on the right is the Athenaeum. And I want to zoom in a little bit and bring your attention to one store in particular. That's the hardware store, AP Wendell. Um, I've been in the family business for, since 1834 to 1954. Now, look up on the third and fourth floor. You can see um, some of the products that Mr. Wendell's carrying in his hardware stores, paints, oils, varnishes, firearms. Um, in addition to that, contemporary advertisements noted that he had a wide array of dry goods and uh, fireworks and, of course, ammunition for the firearms. So you got a little bit of a mix there. Probably you got to watch how you store that stuff. You, something bad is going to happen. Um, going a little closer, though, and you can see Mr. Wendell is uh, marketing a new product. This is 1907. Now, you see the banner just above the police officer's helmets and right below the hardware sign. Um, Mr. Wendell is now selling gasoline. And, and what was going on here was that there were automobiles are starting to appear on the streets of the United States. And there were no gas stations, at least there weren't in Portsmouth. You needed gas to make your car go. You go down to the uh, hardware store. So. In addition to the fireworks and the uh, kerosene and the uh, ammunition, you throw gasoline into the mix, and you realize that um, some of the some of the people in Portsmouth are getting nervous about the volatile combination here, and they start talking about let's get gasoline out of the city center, and uh, that conversation went on for a while, and eventually by the 1920s they did just that. Meanwhile, down in New York City, the um, this is Lower Manhattan. The big tall building is the Equitable Life Insurance Building. And uh, that's the newest building in this picture here. They, these other buildings were there before, and, and construction technology improved to set, such an extent that they were able to make the buildings taller and taller. But the neighbors to this tall building were not happy because when this went up, suddenly the sunlight that used to illuminate their offices through the windows uh, were blocked by the buildings, and they were they were um, in, the sh in the shade most of the day. So there was a lot of pushback from um, people in the smaller buildings. And the end result was New York City adopted the first municipal zoning ordinance in the United States. Of course, there's immediately challenged in court, but the court upheld it. Now look over on the left. This is RSA 674 in New Hampshire. And you see item number D. This is the purposes of zoning. Line D is to provide adequate light and air. Well, that came right from this this uh, dispute in Lower Manhattan in 1916. What New Hampshire and many other states did is when they grabbed onto zoning, uh, they weren't really thinking about, well, does this really apply to us? They just kind of went along with the crowd. And um, I would argue it doesn't. You know, this idea of uh, providing adequate light and air uh, doesn't really um, serve much purpose here in New Hampshire because we don't have buildings like this. Let's see. Um, but the uh, New Hampshire legislature does update the uh, the purpose of zoning from time to time. You see the first first eight lines, A through H, they date back to the 1920s. But then the legislature is trying to keep current and bring your attention to the last item, item J, to encourage the installation and use of solar, wind, renewable energy systems, da da da. So the legislature is saying, okay, if you're going to have a zoning ordinance, you can. One of the legitimate purposes is to encourage solar. Um, it would be kind of awkward if you're using your zoning to block solar, because obviously the, but the the legislative intent was to encourage it. And then further on in that paragraph, bring your attention to second from last line. It's talking about a solar sky space easements. The legislature is encouraging that as well. I had to look that one up. Um, you know, what it means is that if you uh, you do have a uh, solar facility and your neighbor's uh, trees keep getting bigger and bigger, that could be a problem because the neighbor's trees could block the sunlight from hitting your solar panels. So what the legislature is doing is saying it's okay to purchase an easement from your neighbor on uh, allow you to to keep those trees down to a level that does not block your your solar panels. Now here's another landmark in the uh, history of zoning. This is probably the most important one. This is 
a suburb of Cleveland, Ohio called Euclid. And in 1923, Euclid adopted a, a comprehensive zoning ordinance. Remember in New York, they were focused on light and air. They were, they were just fighting over the, uh, the shadows down in lower Manhattan. Euclid is something that's much more familiar to us. Euclid uh, tried to preserve the suburban character of their, their town. And they did a very uh, structured ordinance, very stringent actually. And they, they introduced a lot of concepts we're familiar with today. And you can see them just looking at this, this aerial photograph. You can read a lot into this aerial. You can see just from the aerial that um, the houses are all set back the exact same distance from the street. It looks like to be about 20 feet. Uh, you can also see, uh, well, you can't see from the picture, but I can tell you because I've been there. These are single family houses. They're all have side yard setbacks that are approximately the same and rear yard setbacks. Um, importantly, and this is important for solar, is you can, you can see they also have uh, minimum lot size requirements and open space requirements. By open space, I'm talking about the lawns and the trees and the shrubbery. And just uh, just eyeballing it, I would guess that the open space requirement in Euclid, just judging from this photograph, is about 50%. You can see every one of these houses is, uh, is about 50% green space. What's also striking too is that the, uh, after 100 years, there's very little variation here. They, they must have a Board of Adjustment in Euclid, but they don't give out too many variances. You can tell that just from looking at this picture, which is not what, not what I'm accustomed to here in New Hampshire. In New Hampshire, where, uh, as those of you who are on zoning boards are well aware, it's it's hard to say no oftentimes, but uh, evidently they don't have that problem in Euclid. Now, Euclid uh, was trying to create this bucolic suburban environment, but there was also something else that was driving them with this zoning ordinance that prompted this zoning ordinance. So they were fearful. You know, they lived, they, they worked and shopped and um, in the nearby city of Cleveland, but they didn't want to be like Cleveland. They wanted to leave Cleveland at the end of the day and come home to the suburbs. And they were fearful that Cleveland was going to follow them east into their town. They were fearful that industry was going to come into Euclid. So that was the primary driver behind um, their zoning ordinance. They, they prohibited um, industry. This is the Republic Steelworks in Cleveland, and this is exactly what the folks in Euclid did not want to become. So um, the industrial developer named Ambler had already invested some money in land in Euclid, and he wasn't happy when he got zoned out. And it ended up in the Supreme Court. In 1926, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of Euclid. They said that the Municipal zoning is a valid use of the police power under the Constitution. And that was a landmark case, probably the most important case in, in um, land use regulation in, in the United States. So back to this aerial photograph again. Uh, you know, the aerial tells us about setbacks, of dimensional requirements. Obviously, you don't see any industry in this picture. You could prevail. And open space, but let's, let's just make a mental note of open space. Back when zoning began, open space meant uh, trees and lawn and, and uh, green space. Over time, that would evolve, and, and planners and planning boards would interpret that requirement to mean, well, not too much hot top. They, thought, they realized that if you have too much pavement and impervious surface, that would cause stormwater problems. But I'm just bringing us back to 1923 to show you that the original intent of the open space requirement was to, to maintain a suburban aesthetic. Now, Euclid had a huge influence, and part of the reason it had a huge influence in cities and towns all across the United States was that this fellow up in the upper right, Herbert Hoover, was the uh, Secretary of Commerce, and he embraced Euclidean zoning and thought it was a good, good idea for every city and town in the country. Congress got on board too. They passed the standard state enabling state zoning enabling act, encouraging municipalities to adopt zoning. And this this uh, um, this paragraph down below Mr. Hoover's photograph. I don't know if you guys can can read it, but what it is is it's it's taken from that federal law, but it's it it was carried lock, stock, and barrel into New Hampshire, the New Hampshire legislature in the 1920s adopted it word for word. This is RSA 674, section 17. It has changed very little in 100 years. 
This is where it came from. Now, is this such a good idea to take a suburban zoning ordinance and bring it to New Hampshire? I would say there's a lot of problems with that. Um, up on the upper left is Washington, New Hampshire, and um, upper right is Nashua. And the, the, uh, these, both these communities were predated Euclidean zoning. Uh, they've, Euclidean zoning in New Hampshire is, is they, there's been this effort over 100 years to, to impose this suburban blueprint on top of communities that were all existed. And uh, that's, that's caused a lot of problems. It's, it's not a good fit. Uh, but even even the the purposes of the Euclidean zone are spelled out here on the lower left gives you an idea why it's not a good fit. Look at look at the last two to prevent the overcrowding of land and to avoid undue concentration of population. Well, if you're if you're a merchant or a restaurateur in downtown Nashua, you you want people to come down there. The people you know Nashua's worked hard for the last thirty years to to um, bring folks into downtown and, and revitalize it and make it a you know, a fun place to be. Um, so, that, which is the opposite of what Euclid wanted. Euclid didn't want industry, they didn't want crowds. Um, so you already got this in, built in conflict. Uh, now, uh, I've been, um, one, one, of the, one of the cities I, I, I work for, and I, I did this with my colleague Liz Durf, he's also a planner. We collaborate a lot on zoning and master plan projects. We were hired by the uh, city of Saco, Maine, to rewrite their zoning ordinance. Um, Saco had a, a problem in that the, the ordinance they had, had had grown over the years. Um, it was just a lot of stuff added to it and not much thought going into those additions. So the zoning grew to this massive size, it's 450 pages. And Saco knew they were in trouble and they hired us and we said, we're going to, we'll put it on a diet. We're going to get rid of this bloat. And we basically threw out the old ordinance and started over again. But when you do something that radical, you know, one of my main intents was to make sure we we didn't hurt any small businesses or residents along the way. We want to protect people who are already there. So we ended up making a lot of the, um, the businesses that had been non-conforming into conforming uses just by rewriting the ordinance. But uh, we also were um, um, interested in modernizing the zoning. You know, the SACO had no no provisions for solar farms, and I asked them, "What well, do you want one?" And they said, "Yes, yes." So, so we added that to it, and then of course we updated the use table, and we had to redefine open space. And here's the uh, here's downtown SACO. The the suburban um, ordinance had had uh, not been helpful to redevelopment efforts in downtown. A lot of the second, third floor stories were, were empty because they were they were a poor fit for this uh, Euclidean zoning ordinance that came along afterwards. The uh, and in, in Maine we, we, we had this um, model ordinance for uh, was written by a environmental organization and it was well intentioned of course but you know it's 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 it was 12 pages long and what they want you to do is they want you to copy their model ordinance and just insert it into your zoning ordinance. This is um, usually it's, it adds a lot of verbiage to ordinance, but it, it's many times it's very redundant. It's not very helpful. And in this case, you can see some of the things they were they were saying was, well, whatever the rear yard setback is for accessory buildings in that zoning district, meaning uh, why do you even need this verbiage? It's not even um, useful. You already have your setbacks elsewhere in the ordinance. And, um, and any additional setbacks may be required to mitigate visual and functional impacts. Well, as those of you who are on planning boards know, you can't just make up additional setbacks on the fly. That's not how it works. So, um, yeah, that's that's one of my pieces of advice is to avoid these model ordinances, no matter how well intentioned they are. And let's see. But you should uh, define your terms, and uh, a term that I use both in Seabrook and in Saka to define solar farms, solar farms are vernacular, that's what people understand, but of course you've got to get the technical term in case you get hauled in the court, you don't want to get your definition picked apart. So um, this is what we came up with, was a photovoltaic power station. And 
it does a job. It's not lengthy, but it gets you where you want to be. Uh, in the town of Seabrook, um, we were trying to decide where to where to allow um, solar farms and where they would be a bad idea. You do that in the use table. This is a, a section of the use table. And you see that um, one of the top lines is solar farms. In Seabrook, we have eight different zoning districts, one through six M. And we ended up, uh, the P stands for permitted use, the N is not permitted, and the C is permitted as a conditional use. So in Seabrook, we, we ended up permitting it in zone two and three, and then a conditional use in zone one. Not there in the real world, that accounts for about one half of the town's land area. So in Seabrook, about half the town's land area can, can be used for solar farms on one, um, the other can't. Now, uh, it's important to get this in the ordinance. Uh, when when we, we were approached by solar developers and they, 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 they told me where they wanted to build a solar farm. And I said, well, well, that's, uh, he did the first part right. That's, that's in a part of the town where the zoning permits it. And they say, yes, yes, we know that. Um, because that's the first thing we always look for. And it's, it's like that with any developer, no matter what kind of development they're promoting. Uh, the, the smart ones, and most of them are pretty smart, first thing they look for, well, is it permitted by the zoning or isn't? Am I going to be butting my head up against City Hall and have to go to the Board of Adjustment, or will I, will I be um, accorded um, this use as a, by right? So it's important to, to um, address solar farms in your land use table, as we did here in Seabrook. Now, remember a discussion a few minutes ago about open space. Um, this is where a 100-year-old zoning um, regulation meets up with a solar farm with a bad result, and that was in Concord five years ago. Um, there was a proposal for 10 month, I believe it was 10 megawatt um, solar farm down near the Merrimack River. And what, what the uh, code enforcement officers did in Concord, they interpreted the zoning ordinance correctly, but the zoning ordinance is really a bad fit for, for, for solar farms. And they, they treated the solar panels as though they were the same as the parking lot, which they're not. Um, and of course, the, uh, at the end of the day, the code enforcement said, well, you have too much impervious services. It doesn't comply with our zoning ordinance, which unfortunately um, is, is uh, uh, they, they interpreted the ordinance correctly. It's just the ordinance is, is way out of date. And so it just cannot accommodate us all from. Uh, so we had two definitions of open spaces. Is the Euclidean one on the right, where they're trying to preserve uh, green space but that's not the same as the solar farm. And then you had the, uh, what they were doing in Concord, that is they were equating the solar farm with the parking lot. Now with parking lot on the right, you know, when it rains hard, the, the rain is gonna pick up um, automo automo uh, automotive fluids that may have dripped from some of those cars and it's gonna carry it pretty quickly over into the uh, catch basins. And from there, it's gonna end up in your local waterways on the left, the same rainstorm is going to hit the solar panels. How much of that rain is going to go into the, uh, the grass percolate into the ground? Uh, if it's a really heavy rainstorm or if your solar farm's built on a slope, uh, some of that water is going to leave the site. But uh, because of the grass, it's going to be, um, the grass is going to take out some of the pollutants. It's also going to slow the velocity of the stormwater. So this is, uh, this is apples and oranges. And unfortunately, in Concord, Concord's ordinance was was um, not up to date with you know up to date enough to deal with a solar farm, and they ended up um, turning them down and uh, was up, it was upheld in court because the the Concord officials acted correctly. It's just their zoning ordinance was was uh, was way out of date. And they couldn't accommodate a solar farm. So here's uh here's another thing you can do with your definitions um you know the, the 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 first line is land area not covered by pavement or buildings um that's typically what, what you have for a definition open space in new hampshire these days that's the the one equating it with with you know too much pavement but if you want to get around what happened in concord you've got to uh, adjust that definition 
to make it clear that the solar panels are not subject to open space regulations. Otherwise, you're going to end up where Concord did, and you're going to have your old zoning ordinance interpreted in such a way that the, the solar farms are not possible. Now, there are a number of other regulations in your uh, site plan review regs and in other parts of your zoning ordinance that are relevant to a proposal for a solar farm. Um, erosion control and stormwater management are um, prominent. Now, here in New Hampshire, you don't have to, the planning board doesn't have to worry too much about that for a solar farm, and here's why. The, the, uh, in, in this New Hampshire DES will require an alteration terrain permit for any proposal that impacts 100,000 square feet or more. So, um, so they, they do a pretty good job at um, making sure that the, the applicant does what's necessary to prevent erosion and uh, stormwater from having an adverse impact, particularly off-site. Now, uh, 100,000 square feet sounds like a lot, but for a solar farm, it's not actually. It would be about half a megawatt. And if we're talking about utility scale mega solar farms, which, which I am today, are the ones that, that send electricity into the larger grid, um, New Hampshire DES is going to catch every one of these projects. So they're going to be on top of that issue. That's going to take some burden off the local planning board. Uh, operations and maintenance, that's always a good practice. I think most of you have those in your regulations already. But that's another thing where DES is going to insist that the applicant come back and have a schedule for making sure that the stormwater infrastructure is maintained on a regular basis and somebody's responsible for doing that. Uh, an endangered species, that's uh, another uh, fact you have to keep in mind if you know of any areas of your community where, where you believe there are endangered species, you're going to have to factor that into the review as well. Historic resources, of course, by historic, you're mostly looking at archaeological in these um in seabrook we weren't concerned because the uh, the uh, the site had already been extensively surveyed by archaeologists um 50 years ago screening uh screening is an issue for any kind of commercial industrial development if you're close to residential neighborhoods um so you've all been down that road before those of you who are on planning boards What's a little different with the uh, the solar farms is the typical screening is the less expensive one, and that's to plant some trees. You got to uh, approach that cautiously here with solar farms because the trees will grow, and they could be a problem later on for the for the uh, solar farms if they're too close to the panel, so it could cast shade on the, the panels. Emergency response: these solar farms don't often catch on fire. Um, but it's possible, and if it does catch on fire, it's going to be an electrical fire. So you want to get your fire chief into conversation. Uh, and what they're probably going to be told is by the solar farm operators to look, we'll we'll take care of it. We're going to shut off the electricity, and we'll deal with what's going on. Um, and they're, they're usually the, the local fire department is, is advised just to, to stand down and, and observe from a distance. Wildlife corridors, of course, if you're going to develop, you know, 20, 30 acres, you good chance you're going to disrupt some wildlife corridors. For the smaller animals, that's easily uh, fixed by uh, making sure the perimeter fence is five or six inches off the ground so the animals can continue to pass through as they always have. And then there are, of course, wetlands. You all deal with wetlands all the time because there are a lot of wetlands in New Hampshire. And, a lot of development pushing into wetlands and yes there are people out there that are proposing to have solar farms on wetlands it's a bad idea i know um there's one of those going on in rochester right now and it did not end well for the city or the developer they're in court this is uh back to seabrook again of course where i'm the town planner this is last june i was meeting with the uh solar development team for NextEra Energy, they proposed a uh, four and a half megawatt solar farm uh, on their property uh, close to the nuclear power plant. What you see in the background, this is this land had been used for many years now as a storage area for spare parts for the nuclear power plant. Yeah, in, in the distance, you see um, those electrical lines are what's called three phase. It's, Means they they have the capacity to 
carry electricity from the solar farm into the grid. So that's good. That's this this site had a lot of things going for it. Uh, these people here, they come up from Florida. That's where the company's based. And we were walking the site to, uh, to see if we could find any issues and uh, what they would need to do to prepare them for the planning board. Um, by the way, this one was approved. It was approved in uh, February. It's going to be the largest, to my knowledge, it's going to be the largest solar farm in the state when it, uh, when it uh, gets turned on at the end of the year and connects to the grid. And then when you are reviewing the solar farms, there's always things that you, you just, you, you about his concerns, you just don't know what to say, you can't deal with them, they, they seem kind of far-fetched, but you, you want to be responsive. Um, and and of course the abutters are like any other industrial commercial development, but they're they're concerned about any adverse impacts or any change that, that, that they'll experience. And this is your 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 backstop. And that is if there's anything that the, the regulations have missed that you can't address, but there's still a possibility that there's going to be a problem out there, like glare or reflections or whatever they, they think might happen. You can you can you can say, look, the the code enforcement officer is is has the tools to address something like that. This is the I call it the all-purpose backstop. And most of you have a provision like this in your zoning ordinance dealing with nuisances, and it's designed to, to deal with pretty much anything that's uh, that is a nuisance. It's not otherwise addressed in the ordinance, but it's you know it's not the type of thing you want your residents to be subjected to. Now, uh, another element of these solar proposals is decommissioning plans. That's standard fare in um, solar farm proposals. I, 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 I'm I, going to take a minority view here because I'm going to ask the question, why, why are they even doing this? I don't think it's even appropriate, and I'll tell you why. Over on the left, we have a nuclear power plant. Should that have a decommissioning plan? Absolutely, because uh, the, the, uh, the plant has a lifespan of 50 to 75 years, but the, the fuel rods that are um, drive, you know, producing the power, they, they get taken out and stored, and um, they, they are radioactive for another 10,000 years. So you got to make sure that somebody takes responsibility for those, um, and you got to make sure that the property owner, the plant operator, has put some money on the table to ensure that they're properly handled uh, far into the future. So yes, decommissioning plan is very much appropriate for nuclear power plant and Seabrook on the left. Um, but then, uh, you know, I asked the question, why do solar farms have to have a decommissioning plan where you, uh, commercial development does not? You know, in, in all our cities and towns, it's just a normal course of events that businesses succeed and sometimes some of them fail. And we have that in every single city and town. We have, from time to time, we'll have empty shopping centers, empty factories, empty stores. But we never demand decommissioning plans from those folks. Um, and <clears throat> Walmart's, Walmart, in fact, is uh, kind of stands out because they 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 have a they've had a history. Of they'll they'll build a store in a very prominent location in the community, right by the gateway to your community. And then 10 or 20 years later, they'll say, oh, well, well, let's build a bigger store down the road, have a super Walmart. And they just walk away from the old one. And then they, they leave some deed restrictions in there that prevent um, the old building from being used to sell any product that Walmart sells. So th these are tough to, to these, these are brownfield sites that are tough to redevelopment just because of the deed restrictions. So if, if you're going to argue for a decommissioning plan, Walmart might be a candidate, maybe not. That can be debated. But certainly, Walmart, um, empty Walmarts are more of a uh, drag on the community's image than solar farms. Solar farms are really easy to uninstall. When these thing, the, the owner of the land on the right decides, okay, uh, I'm done with solar, I want to do something else here. Or maybe they just walk away from it. It's, it's number one, the solar farms are usually not on the gateway to the city or town. They're usually off in the back, back land. And secondly, there it's really easy to take them apart, and you, you get you get this grassy field when you're down. As opposed to what you get in the middle, which would be a you know paved parking lot. So, uh, I guess the point being is that's that's the current practice is that is to require decommissioning plans for solar farms 
Um, I'm, I'm dissenting from that view, but I know I'm in a minority. Let's see. Then uh, siting considerations. This is where um, up until now we've talked about planning board's role in, in reviewing a proposed solar farm, but planning board, and it probably came up this morning um, in, in this planning board track, is this planning board has two functions. One is, is quasi-judicial when you review a, an application for, for site plan approval or subdivision approval. And the other one is legislative. Legislative is when you're setting policy. And that is when you're making this decision, okay, well, let's let's adjust the zoning ordinance. Say you've decided you want to have solar in, somewhere in your community, but you're not sure where. And you're going to go through the process of figuring out the most appropriate places. That's legislative because once the planning board decides, okay, solar makes sense over here, but not over there. Uh, planning board has no authority to to um, put that into law. It has to go to the city council or town meeting in order to be adopted formally. But uh, that's a policy um, process. And, and, and the, the town meeting and the council are gonna record, they're gonna rely on the planning board to, to come up with a good policy. And this is what I'm addressing right here momentarily is when you going around your community trying to figure out where, where it makes sense to have solar, these are some of the factors that uh, you, you'd want to consider the, you know, the capacity of the, the grid in the immediate vicinity, the proximity to residents. You don't want to put some non-residential use into the uh, middle of a high density residential neighborhood where the neighbor where, where the residents aren't embracing it. And usually they don't. Uh, of course, you want to make sure you're not um, um, proposing it for an area that has rare plants or animals. Uh, then there's a big discussion about whether solar and agriculture should go together. We'll get into that in a minute. And then the uh, forest, we'll talk about that as well. It's, you know, one of the one of the benefits of the solar, it doesn't uh, release any greenhouse gases, it generates electricity, but does not contribute to climate change. Um, so there's, there's going to be a, a trade-off there between um, whether you preserve the forest, which also grabs carbon out of the air or build a solar on the same same site. Um, we'll talk about that momentarily. So the first thing you got to do is figure what part of town has, has the infrastructure to make solar even possible. That means proximity to, to uh, transmission cables that, that carry the electricity to the grid. Uh, what we're looking at here is, is uh, what's called three-phase power, and that's, uh, that's it's, it's more power than you find in your residential neighborhood, but um, if you're going to find this type of thing, various parts of your town, mostly around commercial and industrial. But you've got to find out where it is, because if you say you're going to, let's say you think, okay, the western part of town is going to be a great place for solar, and then you look on the utility map and you figure out, well, yeah, but it's like, you know, mile two miles from from three phase power, it's not going to work. Nobody's going to nobody's going to build it there. So you you got to kind of uh, keep that in mind when you're deciding where uh, solar makes sense in your community. Over here on the right is just a screenshot from um, the EverSource website. You can uh, on the website itself, you can you can zoom in and have a close look, and more details come up. But that, that will give you an idea. Um, where, where the power transmission lines are in New Hampshire. Um, I'm not an electrical engineer, and you guys probably aren't either, so what really makes sense is to invite uh, Eversource or whoever your local transmission utility is and have come in and talk to you and explain where the, uh, where the power is and where it isn't. But you can get in, you can get in a, uh, you get a little bit of an idea of when you go on their website. Now, <clears throat> Proximity to residents. Some, in some places, solar farms go in uh, without any controversy at all. But lately, particularly out in the Midwest, it's generating a lot of heat, and uh, it's it's uh, people are really getting fired up. And and you, uh, and you say, well, what? Why? What, what's what's getting them so excited with the solar farm? And uh, this actually, uh, uh, it hasn't come to New Hampshire yet, but it's because we don't have much solar here. But um, out in the Midwest, in the last couple of years, the uh, just just been a lot of acrimony about solar proposal, 
And it turns out that a lot of the people who are getting wound up over it are, are getting wound up. It's, a, it's actually a professional effort from out of state to um, feed them a lot of misinformation. Um, and and they, they, they trace it back to uh, a lobbying firm in, in Washington, D.C. that's getting its funds from the two largest coal companies in the United States. And what's going on is coal is starting to feel threatened by solar. So they're, they're, um, they're fighting back at the local level uh, with a disinformation campaign, and it's causing, causing some pretty exciting uh, planning board meetings out there in Indiana and Ohio. The guy on the left is a farmer who thought it would be a good idea to rent some of his land to a solar developer, and the people on the right are the neighbors who, were, um, who uh, <sighs> came to the planning board, and, and I think they, got, they, got, um, they had some pretty adverse reactions there. Of course, as I said before, you're, you you don't want to plop your you don't want to designate a part of town where you have some sensitive species and a good place to start to figure out where that might be within the Hampshire Heritage Bureau. They can they won't tell you exactly where the species are, but they'll give you an idea, and that's what you really need to know. And then, of course, is uh, there's there's a lot of discussion with the solar gets along with agriculture. There's two um, two two ways of thinking of this one. Um, one is that there are a lot of folks out there trying to make the tool work together. It's called dual use. See, in this instance, they got the sheep and the goats are able to go underneath the panels. And over here, they're trying to figure out how to grow crops underneath the panels as well. The, the, um, uh, there are some who say, well, you can't, you, you shouldn't put solar panels on agricultural land, but you can see these, there are people working hard to make, make, uh, make both possible on the same land. Going back to Saco for a minute, um, over here on the left is, is the, uh, a big traffic jam, it's uh, Route 112, and it happens twice a day, once in the morning rush and once in the evening rush hour. What's going on is the cost of housing in Portland, 20 miles away, is has gone way up. A lot of middle class people can no longer afford to to buy a home in Portland, and they're going further and further out. And this is 20 miles southwest of Portland. And what's happened off Route 112 is the uh, residential developers have um, uh, built a lot of subdivisions with dead end streets. And uh, the only way in and out is Route 112, and if you do this enough over you know a number of years, what you're going to end up with is this, this big traffic jam, and that's what's happening there. Now, reason I'm I'm showing this issue here in Saco, 20 miles out from Portland, is because Saco has a lot of great farmland, and um, the developers, the residential developers, are eyeing that farmland. Farmland's really easy to develop, but uh, that's uh, that's that's a tough thing because uh, it's good for the residential developer, but bad for the rest of us if we lose our farmland. Now, during the course of our zoning rewrite project in Saco, I met some of the farmers. Uh, this fellow on the right, uh, he was on our um, oversight panel that was, was part of the zoning rewrite. Uh, his name is Tim Leary, and he's, he's a, he owns a big farm in, in Saco, and it's been in the family for generations, and he introduced me to some of the other farmers. And they, they're, uh, they're in a tough spot because they've been working hard all their lives, not making much money. They love what they do, but they get us to a certain age where they need to find some income to retire. <laughs> and they don't have too many choices. And of course, the residential developers, that's the picture on the left, the, the people who generate the traffic, <clears throat> they're, they're offering a lot of money for this farmland to, to Converted into residential housing, single-family housing. Uh, the farmers, you know, they're, they're in. That's a tough choice. They don't want to give up the land. They don't want to, um, you know, particularly if the farm's been in the family for, for several generations. It's a tough thing to do. But they don't have too many options. But, but what we discovered in Saco is that solar is actually um, is actually a good way to to um, Preserve farmland because it's it, it provides the the farmers with another option other than residential development. They they get to uh, keep the ownership of the 
land in the family. They, they'll lease it out to a solar firm for 20, 30 years, get steady income every year. So uh, I don't view the um, solar as a conflict with preserving farmland. I, I view um, the, uh, the actually in a place like Saco, and, and of course there'll be places in New Hampshire just like this. It's, it's, a, it's a great way to preserve the farm, uh, preserve the agricultural land over the long term, because as we mentioned earlier, uh, 20, 30 years from now, if you decide, well, let's go grow vegetables out there instead of solar farm, you can you can dismantle the, the solar farm fairly easily. And uh, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the, the question of, well, do you chop down a forest in order to build a solar farm? Is that really gaining anything in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions? Uh, the answer is, I don't know, but it's a really great discussion to have this this picture here is from an article in the Daily Hampshire Gazette. It's a daily newspaper in Northampton, Massachusetts. And of course, they were seeing that in Massachusetts. The government of Massachusetts is encouraging solar farms. And uh, they may have gone too far in that their Massachusetts out, particularly in the western part of the state, is losing a lot of trees to solar panels. And you've got to ask the question, well, if that makes sense? And maybe it doesn't. And um, this is my view on what's coming down the line in the future, 20, 30 years from now. I mean, I viewed solar as kind of an interim, a bridge solution. Um, the, I think the, the future lies out in the Gulf of Maine. There's just a huge potential for wind power there that's going to be um, inexpensive eventually when they, get, when they get to develop it. And it's a very windy place. But to give you a sense of just how much potential is out there in Gulf of Maine. Um, it's 56 gigawatts, and that's about 45 times as much as um, it's produced by the Seabrook nuclear power plant. So just the wind power alone in the Gulf is, the, is roughly the equivalent of 45 nuclear power plants. And uh, that's that, I believe, is a long-term solution. Solar is more of a short-term um, solution to address the, the um, the challenge of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Now, I'm going to leave you that uh, with solar for now and, and move into the next part of this presentation, and that's electrical vehicle fast chargers. Um, what we're looking at here is uh, a Tesla supercharger station from Seabrook that was installed in 2015. This is a uh, New Hampshire Public Radio, ran an article back in February, uh, giving us a little glimpse of the future. We're gonna have uh, a lot more electrical vehicles on the road over the next decade. Um, this is New England wide, but of course, a big part of New Hampshire's economy is dependent on tourists from Southern New England who will be driving up here. More and more of them will be arriving in electric vehicles. Uh, if, if um, Maine and Vermont are well equipped to to receive these stores because they have a lot of EV fast chargers out there already. New Hampshire is, is behind, so New Hampshire's got to get its act together if it's going to um, you know, avoid damaging the tourist economy. Now down in Seabrook, what I like to do sometimes is try to get a sense of the market and who's actually using these things. So I go out and introduce myself to random strangers and interview them and ask them, you know, what brought them to this um, charging station in the first place. And eventually, they're, they're, invariably, they're not from Seabrook, they're from all over the place. This fellow named Ned, he came from Newmarket to charge his car. He comes here. Um, it's really the only place he can charge. He explained that he and his wife live in an apartment building in Newmarket. Uh, and and they, they still went out and bought an electrical vehicle, even though they can't charge it at at home, what they have to end up doing is driving to Seabrook to charge the vehicle. But uh, he he likes his electric car. He says his wife, and uh, he he was he's telling me this is his new car. He said he paid fifty thousand dollars for it. But he he said you know they did they they crunched the numbers. They said that given that the, the electric vehicles are cheaper to operate and maintain, that that he's gonna this is actually a better deal than buying a, a conventional uh, gasoline. Um, vehicle for thirty thousand dollars. So they're uh, that's 
That's one insight into the market in Seabrook. Right. The, the other thing that um, is, is problematic is, like, like me, there's a lot of people that live in buildings that they don't own, and that means they, they don't have the option of installing uh, charges at, um, at their homes. They're depending on the landlord, and in an era when the, there's a housing shortage in New Hampshire, landlords don't have too much incentive to, to invest on extra uh, amenities like the charges. So that means a lot of people who are are, are renting are are, are, are not going to be able to um, purchase electric vehicles. This wouldn't be practical unless there was a fast charger somewhere close by. In Ned's case, he had to drive all the way to Seabrook. But you know what really needs to happen is you've got to have the fast charges um, in in every city and town in order to give renters a, a chance. Uh, we're looking at Gate Street and Portsmouth. Even if you're not a renter, these these homes are, are owner occupied, but that's another class of people who, who are unable to charge at home because a lot of these uh, cars on the street belong to the residents. They, they don't have off street parking, there's not enough space. Now, most of New Hampshire, that's not a problem, but uh, here, here in Portsmouth, where I live, um, there are a lot of people in that situation. So, uh, <clears throat> for Portsmouth is just 46 percent of the people rent, so they're they're at disadvantage. Plus, the people who don't have uh, off street parking that brings you up to half the population. It's impractical for them to get an electric vehicle unless there are charging stations in 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 publicly available charging stations, fast chargers. And then uh, just uh, just. Earlier this month, the Biden administration was uh, decided that the transition to EV wasn't going fast enough, so they're they're, uh, they're making taking some measures, mostly putting more pressure on gasoline-powered vehicles. Um, but their goal is to speed up the transition uh, to from um, fossil fuel to electric. And the other reason this is important is is when you're looking at the um, reducing greenhouse gases in New Hampshire, uh, transportation sector is responsible for 47% of everything up there. So that's that's why the transition to EV is, is very important because that's, that's a big part of the problem right there. And uh, here we're gonna look at the, the, the technology a little bit. This, this is important to understand it. the three Three categories of charges: level one, two, and DC fast charge. Uh, level one is is very inexpensive. You can plug it into a, a regular outlet in your home. Um, that's the advantage. The, the disadvantage: it takes forever to charge a car. Level two, you can have those at home, and sometimes you see them down at um, uh, various public buildings. They're they're also popular in hotels. Level two or Fairly inexpensive. They they uh, draw the same amount of electricity as your clothes dryer would, um, and but they would take eight to twelve hours to charge your car. Now <clears throat> that works well if you're in a hotel. You just you plug it in at night, and the next day you 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 you're ready to go. Your car is fully charged. Of course, it works well at home too. At the end of the day, you plug it in, and uh, the next morning is fully charged. It doesn't work well in other situations, so but those are the two applications where level two doesn't make sense. DC fast charge is a different type of technology. That's not alternating current, that's direct current, and it's high voltage, but that's going to get you charged really fast. That's going to, on average, about 25 minutes, but some of the uh, some of the newer cars have better batteries, and they, you're seeing charge times of 15 and 20 minutes. DC fast chargers are expensive, way too expensive to install um, at home. They're, they're, they're running at least $100,000 for one of these things. So these are commercial operations, um, but they're, they're really important part of the uh, picture because they, they, they um, fill, fill a niche that the other two cannot, the other two take way too long. And this, uh, this chart here shows you just how different level one and two are from the DC fast chargers. Uh, they're different technologies. So your battery takes direct current and the DC charger on the right delivers that current um, really fast. It, 
they, typically they're they're 50 kilowatts, but they can go up to 350 kilowatts as seen here. And over on the left, those are the two um, charges that operate from um, alternating current, and they take quite a bit longer to charge. There's a little converter inside the car to, to handle that. Now, these are some of the terminologies you run into when you're looking at regulating the um, electric vehicle charges. The, uh, the, the connectors, the four connectors in this diagram, connectors and plugs are uh, being the same thing, they're synonymous. Uh, but you typically, they, you hear the word plug rather than connector. Um, in this picture here, you got three ports, meaning you, you could have um, three cars charging at the same time, but not four. The, the fourth connector is, you know, for a different type, uh, for various types of different makes and models of electric vehicles that have different uh, connection systems. So that's why we have a fourth connector there. And these, uh, these, these are what the plugs look like, reflecting the technology level one on the left, the one you plug into your household um, receptacle. Level two, of course, that takes say to 12 hours, it could be the standard J1772 or the Tesla. And over on the right are the three different plugs in the VC fast charging lineup. Now, this, uh, this map here shows you the, um, it shows you why it's important to to um, have fast charges in the, in the, in the travel corridors. The the uh, on on the left you have everything that's 50 kilowatts or more, and on the right are the uh, more powerful charges. Those are the uh, these. 200 kilowatts. The, the maps are, we, you can pull these right off of these apps called Charge Hub or Plug Share. You can download them on your desktop uh, computer if you want, but typically people download them onto their smartphones. And if you're, if you're driving in an electric vehicle, it's going to tell you what's up ahead because you'll be looking and you say, okay, I'm going to need a charge. What are my options here? And um, you, can, you can see there's quite a few options on I-95. But if you're looking for a really fast charge, you'd be looking on the one on the right. And here's, uh, here's, here's the situation in New Hampshire as a whole. Um, this is coming from the uh, US Department of Energy, the Alternate Fuel Data Center. And what they've done is they've mapped all the fast charges in the United States. And this is a segment of the, um, the, the um, it shows Southern New Hampshire. There's, there's actually two that are uh, up in the north that aren't on this map, um, up in Conway and Lincoln. But um, you, you can, what you're looking at here is 24 fast charges in New Hampshire's fast charging stations. And um, if you if you go on this map on the um, U.S. Department of Energy site, you can they'll tell you you just hover over and they'll they'll give you a lot of information on that particular charging station. That's what I did. I wanted to see if there are any patterns emerging here. And um, what we've counted was 26 stations and 126 plugs in the entire state. And I was interested not only in just uh, which which um, charging companies were uh, where, but on the types of locations they were installing these charges in, and, and um, of course the geography and how many which city had had, had uh, you know how many how many plugs. And this is the um, this is the summary. New Hampshire is, is 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 in the early stages of EV charging, so I could fit the whole state onto one one table here. This is it. Uh, that's all the fast charges in the state as of 1921. I'll say um, that is from I mean 20, 2021. I'm sorry. <coughs> there's of course there are other charges that you know, are underway, and there's some that were built last year that are not reflected in this table. But I took that data and I started to extract um, um, what I found to be interesting. And first, I want to know geographically which towns and cities were were racing ahead uh, to accommodate electric vehicles and which ones are not. And you can see that there are five communities in the state there that are well along with fast charges: Concord, um, Cooksett, Lebanon, uh, Salem, and Seabrook. 
Uh, notably, the two largest cities, Nashua and Manchester, were, were pretty far behind, which is interesting. So the development of the fast charges in the state is, is fairly uneven. Uh, then, um, oh, Dan, man, man, I lost my uh, slides here. Stephanie, you're out there? Yes, what's... The slides yeah. disappeared. Oh, wait a minute, here they are, never mind. Okay, a little freeze. Sorry about that. That's okay. <laughs> we have a few glitches here and there. That's what we have to, uh, what we have to put up with, with the technical world. Yeah, all right. You should be on, uh, looks like you're on 61 of 83. Yeah, okay. Okay, very good. Good. Yeah, the, the slider here just uh, keeps... I'll be with you. I'll may, a second. I'm, I, I see what I'm doing wrong here. Okay. I was going to say sometimes you may be able to use the arrows on your keypad. Uh, yeah, I've tried that. I'm on a okay. Mac. Yeah, Mac, Microsoft doesn't play well with my Mac. Yeah, that's true. All right, here we go. Now okay, we're good. Back. Yeah, okay. Good. So, uh, so I was curious who's, uh, who's pushing out these charges, and not surprisingly, I already knew the answer. It was going to be Tesla. I was surprised just how much they dominate the, the charging market in New Hampshire, though. They have 92 plugs out there, superchargers. Uh, and that, that's 73% of all of New Hampshire's fast chargers. Uh, that's good for people who drive Teslas, but if you're driving these other um, vehicles, um, and you know a third of the market is uh, are vehicles other than Tesla, um, that's not going to do any good because you can't plug into a Tesla charger on there they're, they're incompatible um but uh, this is where i uh on the right here this is what i found most interesting is where what, what types of places are these charges being installed and the shopping centers are very popular that wasn't surprising and you know, dunkin donuts is getting in on it um the travel plaza and hooks it Convenience stores have started to get there. Uh, there's a, a ski resort up near Loon Mountain that has fast chargers. And then auto dealerships, because they're starting to sell electrical vehicles. So they're, it made sense that four of them are, four of these dealerships have charging facilities on site. Now, the shopping center makes all the sense in the world because um, it means that you, you can do two things at once. You can run errands and whatever store uh, is in that stopping center you can grab a bite to eat while you plug your car to charge you, you you run your errand and you come back out you finish your lunch you come back out and the, and the car's uh, all set to go so and plus there's a lot of space in these shopping centers there's a lot of parking lot where you can install the charges so that was no surprise but what's missing in this picture and what's missing is um, the, the, the center of the cities, the center of all of New Hampshire cities. No, there's not a fast charger downtown in any of them. And what's going on is Tesla and the other uh, uh, charging infrastructure companies are going for the low hanging fruit. They're going out to the outskirts. They're trying to capture that market for people who go into the supermarket and they come back out and the car is charged. But the people who get in left out are the merchants and the restaurants in the center of our cities and towns in New Hampshire. Um, there, there were no fast charges in any of them. Now, having said this, I'm, I know I'm talking to folks from all over New Hampshire. Um, I'm just going to remind you that my data is from 2021. So that may have changed in some places. Uh, but as of 2021, this was the state of affairs. So the way this is playing out in New Hampshire is the the big chain stores on the outskirts, the Home Depots, the Walmarts, the Targets, um, they're making out. They, they see this as a benefit. They realize this draws traffic to their stores. Um, whereas the uh, smaller businesses in the, in the center of our cities and towns, they, they don't have this advantage. They're falling behind. Um, over here on the left is, is Nashua. It's, it's Martha's Restaurant. And on the right is Portsmouth. These are all local businesses. I, they don't have the option of drawing customers in and saying, okay, let's go, uh, go out to eat in downtown. We'll just charge the car and we come back from dinner and everything will be charged. Uh, so that's, a, that's, a, that's an economic uh, disadvantage to the, the local businesses compared to the 
the uh, the chain stores and the chain businesses that typically occupy the outskirts of the cities and towns. And uh, Tom, here, I just wanted yeah. to jump in for a second, Tom. Sure. Um, we do have a little under five minutes left of the session before we, okay. we break for our afternoon right. session. Just wanted to give well, you a time check. I think I'm right on schedule then. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Thanks, okay. Good. All right. So, uh, so here's an example of how this plays out. You got you got your your uh, charges up on 95. You got your 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 tourists coming up from southern New England. They're either going up to the White Mountains um, or they're going into Maine. And the uh, say they they want to stop for lunch and charge at the same time. They don't have too many choices. You got a lot of charges here, but you wouldn't want to eat lunch in most of these places. Uh, really, Portland and Seabrook are the only choices on this map. Um, and a city like Portsmouth, you can see, I don't know if you can see it, Portsmouth is, is like a desert there. Uh, desert, Portsmouth has great food, but they have no fast charges. So they're kind of, they're damaging their own tourist uh, industry with, with this, by not paying attention to this problem. Now, uh, what can we do to fix the zoning orders? You define the EV charging station. Um, you designate it as an accessory use, not as a principal use, as an accessory use. You adjust the use table and make sure that the charges are expressly permitted. And then if you run into a problem with off-street parking rigs, which we'll get to in a moment, uh, you make sure that you have a, a carve out in the, in the, in the rigs to, to exempt the EV charging stations. Um, this is back in Seabrook again. Here's our supercharger. So this is back when I'm interviewing, I'm going up to, uh, to pester people and ask them who they are and why they came to Seabrook. This fellow, is a Portsmouth police officer. He has a Tesla that she loves, and he has to drive down to Seabrook to get his car charged. And I said, why is that? And uh, I went to look at the Portsmouth zoning ordinance to see what's going on with that. And this is a definition of their motor vehicle service station. It's the only place in the ordinance where electric um, vehicles, electric chargers shows up. And what Portsmouth did is they, they equated gasoline stations with electric chargers, which is a big mistake. Um, and that's why they have no fast chargers downtown because the ordinance doesn't permit gas stations downtown. We know this from back in 1907. Unfortunately, they decided it was a bad idea to have gasoline stations downtown. And then the, the, for some reason, 10 years ago, they said, Electric charges were the same as the gas station, so that prevented them from going downtown too. So look for that. Um, the, uh, I, I, I put this definition in the Google to, to see where Portsmouth came up with this. And Keen, Keen had the same thing. Um, I don't know who copied who, but they one one of them copied the other. But it was just a bad idea. Uh, I had a chance meeting with the city manager in Keene a couple weeks ago. And I said, do you guys fix your, your definition? And she said, yeah, yeah, we realized it was a problem, so we fixed it. I'm going to bring your attention to the last sentence here. It says, this use does not include standalone alternative fuel charging units for vehicles, uh, which are permitted as accessory use in all districts. So Keene went, they really recognized their mistake, and they fixed it big time. And one of the consequences is, uh, they're building their first EV fast charger right now, as we speak out here at the Monena Food Co-op near downtown Keene. And then the, the last problem, and I realize we're running out of time here, is the off-street parking requirements. This thing that looks like a dumpster enclosure really isn't. It's enclosing a transformer. Why do we have a transformer in the middle of the parking lot? Um, and uh, when Electrify America came to Seabrook, I said uh, they they said they, the first thing they asked is, can we can we take up five spaces, put a transformer? And I said sure. Um, and then he said, oh, they were greatly relieved. They said a lot of cities and towns are, don't let us do this they, because it's contrary to the zoning ordinances off street parking requirements. They say you cannot reduce the parking spaces. That's a violation of the zoning ordinance. So here's what it looks like from ground level. This is Electric by America 2017. They uh, they put this in, um, in front of Walmart. Walmart would love to have it up there. There was an agreement that worked for both. And <clears throat> this picture here from above illustrates what was going on. Over on the left, you can see the transformer and also uh, um, 
Uh, well, I'm not an electrical engineer. I don't understand all the equipment. But what they're trying to do is they're trying to to step down to 340, the 34 kV line that fed the shopping center into something with a lower voltage that was more appropriate for the chargers over on the right, where you can see the cars are being charged. But what what the takeaway here is: look at the transformer. They had to they had to take five parking spaces out of this parking lot in order to you know to fit the transformer in there. In a lot of cities and towns, that's not permitted by the zoning laws, the off street parking requirements. Um, so the uh, that's something to keep in mind. You know? And, and they told me, I said, you know, we've just been rejected in Portsmouth because Portsmouth would not let them do this. It, it would be a violation of the off-street parking. But that's not just Portsmouth. That's a lot of places that are like that. So here's a, here's a summary, a recap for fixes for EV. You define the charging station. You designate it as accessory use. Uh, you, you identify those zoning districts where you want them to be permitted. As you saw in Keene's case, they said everywhere. Uh, and then uh, you carve out an exception in your off-street regs uh, for the for the transformers. Or also, you get rid of your off-street parking regs. It's my preference. And that's uh, that's my presentation. Uh, this is a um, Tesla fast charging station in Kennebunk uh, along the main turnpike. So I would welcome any comments or, or questions. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Tom. Mm -hmm. um, we are going to uh, take our break from 2 to 2.15. And then the next session, Tom, if you're able to stick around, um, and as the planner is in, and it is the session Q&A for all of the other previous sessions today. It's a roundtable format, and we take questions from the chat um, from each session and um, discuss them through the panel or particularly with the session speakers. So that will be coming up for the next session. And um, we're going to take a break right now. So we'll see everybody in a few minutes. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you.